I'm going to uh, attempt to, to uh, connect my work as much as possible to the awesome stuff that Fumi just talked about. But um, I'm going to talk about, um, you know, relevance for for uh, human health at much larger uh, and, and much less local time scales uh, and, and try to focus on some of the technology platforms and stuff that we are developing uh, at the Computation Institute um, to look at uh, climate change and food security. Um, I'm going to focus. I'm going to focus as much as I can on Africa, but talk also about some other regions and projects and et cetera. Um, just acknowledgements: RIDSIP, AgMIP, EasyMIP, GDCMI, um, tons and tons and tons, literally hundreds of collaborators from around the world, and lots and lots of support that has gone into the, the work I'm going to present here. Uh, so I'm not going to get into that. Um, all right, uh, a little bit of background. I'll try to race through it. Um, what I'm going to do is that anytime I'm talking about any of IT or technology platforms, the stuff that uh, you know I'm supposed to be talking about in this Discovery Cloud series, I'm going to put the titles in red. So um, for all you guys in the room that, that that don't care about all this crappy background material, you can just ignore it until you see the red titles, and then there will maybe be something interesting. So. Um, okay, so uh, uh, quickly, climate change, what we know um, and uh, and how we know it. So um, uh, briefly, we know that uh, uh, global temperatures are increasing, um, uh, but uh, they're beyond that. Um, we actually don't know a whole lot. Um, there, uh, there's massive amounts of uncertainty from uh, based on you know which climate models you choose to use or how you choose to interpret them and what you assume about the the future pathways, uh, sort of socio technical pathways of human society. And this is. And, and this this knowledge has all been synthesized in, in an experiment that actually started in 1995 called the Coupled Model Intercomparison Project. Um, this is sort of the first uh, MIP project in uh, in the uh, climate in climate science. Um, it's currently in you uh, know um, the the latest version of it is called CMIP five. Although I don't think there's actually been five versions of it. I think there's been three or four versions of it. Uh, but it's been going now for it's it's almost at its I think 20 year anniversary. This project's been going. These results are synthesized from CMIP5. These include, um, you know, almost 40 different modeling groups from around the world, all running um, coordinated experiments to try and synthesize our understanding uh, of how climate is changing in the future. Um, uh, what else do we know about climate change? Well, we, we know that um, there is massive spatial heterogeneity uh, in the way that the climate is changing. So these are, again, results synthesized from um, the CMIP5 archive. Um, what well, the left side is is uh, RCP 2.6, which is this ultra optimistic, um, you know, let's uh, save the world um, socioeconomic scenario in which everyone gets together and stops uh, burning coal and oil. And on the right side is is the most dire pathway, the RCP 8.5, where everybody just keeps on doing what they're doing now. Incidentally, that's the pathway we're on now, um, although, you know, most people believe we'll eventually bend off of it. Um, what you can see is that there are huge spatial heterogeneities in how uh, temperature is warming. So that that global mean temperature number, um, while you know we have relative confidence, um, and again still huge amounts of uncertainty, but relative confidence in how that number is increasing, um, that that is actually hiding um, a giant amount of spatial heterogeneity. There's more warming over land than there is over water. There's more warming in the far northern uh latitudes um than in, than um than further south um and then for precipitation i, I won't talk much about it ba basically we know very little about how precipitation will change um and so uh it's 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 a much more difficult topic so the the first thing uh i i want to just briefly mention for some context um one of the things we do at the center for robust decision making and climate energy policy RIDCEP, at the computation institute is we develop these awesome web apps. Uh, I don't develop them, but other people do. Um, for trying to, uh, for making, um, you know, data like this and uh, information and knowledge like this available more broadly to uh, students, researchers, policymakers, and the general public. And if you want to learn more, if you want to get a better feel for climate change and for for how the climate and and uh, society might change in the future over the next century. Um, these are really great tools to go in and play around with. One of them is called WebDice, which is this super simple economic integrated assessment model um, that's available um, uh, on RIDCEP that you can play around with and change your assumptions about how you think human beings will screw up the world in various different ways and uh, see what will happen. 
And then uh, finally, the, the climate emulator is another tool, which which uh, is a really great tool. It's for, it synthesizes the entire CMIT5 database um, into this really nice usable tool. It allows you to create your own custom CO2 concentration pathways and then um, see how, how hot the world gets and how hot um, your part of the country or your part of the globe uh, will get. So I encourage you to play around with those if you want some more context. All right, so climate change impacts which is what I'm going to talk about from now on. So in 2012, um, the climate change impact community came together and decided that we needed to get on get in on some of this MIP action, try to synthesize um, you know, the knowledge that that has been uh, put together, especially over the last 20 years, um, in 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 characterizing and quantifying the likely impacts of climate change. Um, so we produced. Um, a project that's called EasyMIP, Intersectoral Impacts Model in a Comparison Project. Um, this, this project culminated in a, a publication uh, uh, early, this, early in 2014 of a special issue of PNAS, um, where, where we tried to synthesize basically the knowledge of as much of the climate impacts community as we possibly could. I'm going to talk about a couple of these results just to set the context. Um, and, and, and um, so, you know, I want to warn you that, you know, we're basically where, where CMIP was in 1995. We consider this to be our sort of first pass uh, CMIP one. So we're like 20 years behind them, which, which we're pretty proud of, but we'll see. So first of all, global, global uh, impacts to agriculture, just the direct impacts to agriculture of climate change is the first thing we looked at. Um, uh, the maps here are showing um, the uh, the climate impact in in relative terms of uh, the change in productivity for maize, wheat, soy, and rice uh, around the world um, by the end of the century, the last three decades. Um, the overall result is that the direct effects of climate change in, in, will imply the loss by the end of century of between 400 and 2,600 petacalories of food production, which is uh, about, about 8 to 46 percent of present day production. Um, you'll note that that range is quite wide. Keep that in mind. Uh, other key results, keep in mind, lower latitudes are much more vulnerable to climate change um, and are expected to, to bear by far the biggest brunt of climate change. So that means tropical regions. Uh, Mid-latitude regions have tend to have mixed, show mixed results. And the high latitude regions, unsurprisingly, uh, tend to, to often show uh, positive results uh, from warming as growing seasons get longer and, and, and crops improve. Also, just a massive amount of uncertainty caused by uh, the biophysical, the, the physiological effects of increasing atmospheric CO2, which has, has a, uh, a fertilizing effect on crops, which of course uh, uh, breathe, breathe in CO2 uh, from the atmosphere. Uh, and this ends up being um, the biggest single source of uncertainty in our understanding of the impacts of climate change um, on, on future food production uh, and indeed even, even biome productivity. And I'll come back to this in a second. Uh, we also uh, looked at sort of global resource constraints and the impacts of global resource constraints. So we combine this ensemble of global uh, crop and climate impact models with an ensemble of global hydrological models uh, to look at how climate change and freshwater availability are likely to change over the next hundred years and what in a sort of rough global sense that means for uh, freshwater availability for irrigation and thus for for food productivity um, and the findings are relatively similar the, the limits of fresh water imply that um, if you add up all of these red and pink areas on on this map here imply the need to revert between 20 and 60 million hectares of irrigated cropland to rain-fed cropland by the end of the century, which implies a loss of between 600 and 2,900 petacalories of food production. So um, all I want you to know, remember from this slide is that that's basically the same magnitude of the effect of direct, of the direct effect of climate change. So we have this massive potential effect of the direct effect of climate change with huge uncertainty. This massive potential effect of um, the implications of freshwater availability in, in, in currently arid regions with huge uncertainty. And again, you'll notice um, the regions where these effects are most severe tend to be in lower latitude regions, um, especially in the arid tropical band that spans all the way from China through uh, um, uh, India and, and, uh, and, and North Africa. 
Um, and in a, we, we also took these results. So here's my, here's my first attempt to try and to connect this to human health. Um, we also took these results and combined them with um, some other studies on the implications, um, some experimental, uh, field-based experimental studies, the so-called face experiments, um, um, on the implications of increasing atmospheric CO2 on, on crop and food nutrition contents. Uh, to look at what uh, what the you know a future climate will imp will mean for for nutrition um, uh, or so-called hidden hunger, i.e. The, the components of hunger that are not just about calories and carbohydrates. Um, uh, what what we found is is uh, which is summarized in these in these cute little plates with the red boundaries around them, is that uh, uh, direct climate change um, in the most severe um, um, future scenario, RCP 8.5 implies a loss of something like 25% of global caloric production. But when you add in the effects of CO2 fertilization, um, those global calories um, on, on average are, are mostly um, uh, compensated for. So there's still a loss of about 5% of global caloric production. But when you add in the effects of CO2 fertilization, you actually end up losing about um, an, an equal amount, about a 30% density in macro and micronutrients. So this is like the, the, the protein density and the density of zinc and iron in a lot of key staple food crops, uh, especially um, important crops across the developing world. And this has massive implications for, uh, for health, for, uh, for uh, you know, prenatal health and, and, um, and uh, for childhood morbidity and, 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 all sorts of, and all sorts of things. So um, something to be very, very careful of. Finally, we plugged all these results into uh, an ensemble of big economic models. And here again, I just want to show, uh, uh, mostly want to highlight the uncertainty. Um, we plugged these into economic models to try and look at how um, uh, human adaptation response may end up ameliorating these uh, according to these, this ensemble of economic models. Um, the results in this plot, YXO is the exogenous yield shock that came from the crop, the crop models. Y total is the difference when you add in the potential for human adaptation. Uh, uh, the area means that the global area of agriculture will have to increase by about 10% given this shock, or will be able to respond by about 10% on average. And then finally, if you go to the far right, um, the results for, for, for the global agricultural price index for food is that prices will go up somewhere between zero and 60%, which is which is, as you'll note, a, a very useful result for for planning and policy making. Um, so again, big uncertainties. All right. So uh, red title. So uh, uh, technological solutions. So in response to this this sort of state um, this sort of state of global climate impacts, we began at the CI uh, several years ago to create um, a, a, a multi-model simulation platform we call the Parallel System for Integrating Impacts Models and Sectors, or PSIMS. Uh, PSIMS is just a framework for doing massively parallel, high-resolution climate impact simulations um, at regional or global scales. It as assimilates uh, hugely diverse different data sets, um, uh, manages simulations with multiple uh, climate impact models from multiple sectors, um, and then processes and, and arranges outputs in convenient ways. Uh, PSIM supports, um, wow, you guys are at a 10 second delay from my slides, aren't you? And I'm doing like 10 seconds per slide. So you're, uh, hopefully, hopefully this is coming through reasonably well, but um, keep in mind that I'm probably talking over the wrong slides, but um, PSIM supports simulations with, uh, maybe I should slow down, yeah. PSIM supports simulations with, uh, with dozens of global and regional climate, weather, soil, and management data sets. It also supports multiple models uh, with harmonized inputs. It supports custom uh, outputs and aggregations um, for use in, in, in different regional scale models for aggregation to uh, key administrative or environment or boundaries uh, that are necessary for policy or decision making. Um, it's also uh, totally open source and the software and documentation is available in a GitHub repository. Uh, so you're welcome to take a look at it. PSIMS has been used in a ton of applications. I don't really want to go into it. Um, you know, the one that's most relevant for here is, is you know, multi-model uh, regional analyses, uh, multi-model and multi-scale regional analyses in sub-Saharan Africa. 
looking at looking at at, at crop lead, crop yields using multiple different crop models run with harmonized inputs in order to better understand the potential range of uncertainties and future outcomes. Um, it's also, you know, we're also working on a, a bunch of different really fun applications, like looking at the agricultural implications of a small scale nuclear war in South Asia uh, and how that will affect food productivity in China and the rest of the world and, and all sorts of fun stuff. Lots and lots and lots of fun applications. Um, all right. So here's the most important bit is the next generation of PSIMs who are building um, uh, PSIMs um, installations, cloud installations using Amazon Web Services. Uh, we have prototypes of PSIMs uh, running on EC2 now um, and, and sometimes even use it for our own simulations. Uh, the goal here, of course, is to enable users that don't have access to the kind of large scale uh, local cluster resources that we have at the University of Chicago, allow them to be able to access these high resolution uh, regional simulations using high performance computing. Um, other think directions we're going, ultra large simulations, at least ultra large for us. I don't know if they'd be ultra large for most of the people in the room. And, and then lots and lots of other of other extensions. Um, so why we want to um, so why we want to create these cloud-based PSIMs is again is to enable researchers in a largely in the developing world who don't have access to high performance resources uh, to be able to to run these kinds of um, you know, ultra high resolution um, and highly com computing intensive uh, analyses, um, you know, from within their own browser. And this is where we, we, we partnered starting about a year ago uh, with Funmi and her team at, at, the, um, at the Global Health Initiative. And, um, um, you, you know, the basic, the goal is to try, was to try and look at, you know, the role of food security in public health uh, again, doing detailed modeling of nutrient concentrations in crops and how those um, how those will affect health in different regions of the world. If, uh, you know how different mixes of staple crops in different countries, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, how that will imply for the evolution of nutrient availability, and then connection of agriculture to disease vectors like mosquitoes and malaria. Um, and uh, we 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 even had a fantastic meeting. Um, um, planned and almost implemented back in August in the Ibadan, Nigeria, called the African Food Systems in the Information Age, where we were going to try to launch some of these technologies um, and get users um, throughout Funmi's fantastic uh, network of connections and researchers there. Unfortunately, the meeting ended up falling in that annoying little two-week window where Nigeria was having an Ebola scare. So most of our European and American institutions uh, created travel restrictions and we lost about 80% of our participants and we had to delay the meeting. But we will have this meeting, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scratch out 2014 and put 2015 on that, on that uh, screenshot there. And, uh, and, and uh, we, we will be, uh, we'll be launching that sometime in this next year and we, we, we will have the, the AFSIS meeting and we will harvest big data computational modeling and information technologies for sustainable solutions to food and nutrition and security. Okay, now I want to talk about um, another um, related but different project with another great set of, of, of technological solutions developed by um, uh, the Computation Institute. And I, I've, I've scratched out most of the lines on this slide because I don't want you to read them. But all I want you to know is that um, when, we're, when we're thinking about climate change, we have to think about vulnerability and we have to think about global change because climate is not changing in a vacuum. The world is changing around it. Technology is changing. Uh, the environment is changing. And the one I want to talk about right now is regional heterogeneity, um, poverty, and the diversity of, of, of household systems, uh, especially in developing countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. So we've been working with a project called AGMIP, the AGMIP Regional, Inter the Agricultural Modeling Intercomparison and Improvement Project. They have, um, um, with funding from the UK DFID, the UK AID, they've developed a an really incredible a network of, of researchers throughout Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Um, they are constructed of, of eight regional teams that span 18 countries that include more than 200 scientists. Um, each of these teams is focused on doing a regional um, integrated assessment analysis that takes into account not just uh, not just crops, but livestock and um, household systems. Um, and uh, in, in terms of how 
food is actually produced and how it's used and what food goes to market and what food is used by the household and what food goes to livestock and all the different intricacies of how the household system um, produces outputs. Um, and and uh, these are implemented end to end from, from climate to crop modeling to economic modeling uh, by a multidisciplinary teams uh, in, in, in their key regions. Um, here's just a, a quick look at uh, briefly how the how the flow goes. So we, they, we take global and national productivity uh, from those global studies I was talking about. So global forcing boundary conditions. Um, we pipe that into models of complex farm household systems, which includes largely uh, crop and livestock models. These are mapped to the heterogene heterogeneous uh, environmental and management conditions around the target region. And these produce um, uh, PDS of, of, um, of, um, of <coughs> production systems and agricultural productivity and, and therefore how climate change will affect farmers differently in the, in the region. Currently, here's an, here's an example of, of the way these teams work. So this is for one individual, one of these uh, re, uh, regional integrated assessment teams um, has to perform tons and tons of different scenarios. So they're using multiple crop models. They're simulating a bunch of different um, uh, a bunch of different regions within each within each region. They have tons of different sites, which are basically different farmers' fields. Um, um, they have a bunch of different crops that they're simulating at each site because farmers don't just uh, don't just grow one crop um, uh, in these in these in these uh, household systems. Um, they're simulating over large numbers of years and a bunch of different climate change adaptation scenarios. And when you add it all up, these groups are typically doing somewhere on the order of two million different simulations, uh, which uh, for these groups that are used to working in uh, Windows-based GUI interfaces. Uh, where every single simulation has to be done with a point and click uh, can actually become a little bit frustrating, um, which and apparently they shake their fist against their chins uh, whenever they become frustrated by by how many simulations that that that's requiring. So um, so at the Computation Institute, um, working with the Agricultural Modeling and Comparison Improvement Project, um, we uh, came up with many years ago and has. Uh, um, a, a, a solution to this repetitive um, simulation problem, and of course, it's a it's an IT framework platform form gateway type of thingy, and we call it Face It. It's the framework to advance climate, economic, and impact investigations with information technology. Uh, this project was funded by an NSF Cyber Seas grant that started just over a year ago, um, and uh, we're now into we're now uh, in the uh, second year of a three year project. Face it builds off of the Globus Galaxies platform, which a lot of you are familiar with. So Funmi already talked about, mentioned Globus Genomics, um, uh, which Ravi Majuri has developed, and we've we've stolen basically all of the technology we could from from Ravi and from Globus Genomics. And Ravi has has helped us to 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 put together and and stand up this platform. Um, other Globus Galaxies platforms that are, are newer and people might not be as familiar with is like PDAX and the E-Matter e Material Science. And I put this slide together a couple months ago, so I'm sure there's probably three other Global Galaxies platforms that I don't even know about um, that are already in existence. Uh, the Global Galaxies platform includes tools and workflow execution, publication, discovery, sharing, identity management, data management, et cetera. It integrates Globus technology, with technology from um, a, a, a platform called Galaxy, which I'll talk a tiny bit more about maybe. Um, and it's all done on uh, cloud-based infrastructure with, with really fantastic uh, um, um, and generous support from Amazon Web Services um, um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and et cetera. All right, so the basics of FaceIt. Um, FACET instances are built by and for target user communities, and they're based around familiar data types that those communities are used to working with. Uh, they're also based around familiar programs that operate on these data types. Um, these programs can generate, they transform, they analyze, they visualize data, they do just about anything and everything. Um, it's also, um, there's also a very powerful uh, workflow technology for building up these pipelines. Uh, building up pipelines and chain by chaining together programs 
um, to save, share, and reuse uh, uh, execution workflows. Uh, face it, the key thing, and I, I want to focus mostly on the first one here. Um, face it enables uh, collaboration around the sharing of data analysis and workflows and results. Uh, it makes data ingest and uh, a really convenient. It, and oh, actually, I want to focus on the third one. It allows expert users um, to create workflows and distribute them to less expert participants and collaborate, collaborators. And this is the sort of working model that we found to be um, incredibly powerful within the Agnet community, uh, which has a huge, diverse community of, you know, network of 500 researchers from around the world with very, very different um, uh, skill sets. Um, and they have found a really successful working mode in which, you know, the IT savvy among them are able to create and distribute and publish these fantastic high powered workflows that can then be um, used by uh, researchers from around the world who can plug in their own data, plug in their own analyses, make changes as they need to. Um, and really um, drive their own research. Finally, of course, it provides access to distributed resources and tools, rich social elements, and really enables um, um, researchers, especially in the developing world with less access to, to, to high performance resources, to be able to, to, to do a lot of things they can't normally do with only the need access to a browser. Um, so here's just want to show you one one impressive example of of what the the Agnet community has already done with Faceit. So this is uh, an example of um, a large scale um, Agmip workflow that that has been created. So Faceit uh, power users from the Agmip um, IT team uh, create a number of template workflows. The workflows look like this. There's basically data ingest, data processing. Um, um, to the multi-model execution of different uh, crop yield and climate impact models for different crops. These are passed to to data um, to 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 um, data output processing, and finally to a really diverse and really um, nice array of uh, data visualization tools uh, that they're creating uh, to try and link to their communities. Um, and, and, and as I said, the, the, the local teams, the regional integrated assessment teams in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia can then take these template workflows, they can organize their regional data, and they can rerun these public work, workflows uh, um, without, uh, without, you know, a huge amount of super in-depth knowledge for, for how everything is working. Um, users, uh, just the, the first, you know, few uh, really interesting outputs that are being supported is Users already can create and refine um, really high quality publication publication quality graphics. And I've shown a few examples of these scattered on the right uh, for different use cases. Um, and uh, then there are already a bunch of visualization tools available in R and Python. And, and it's really quite, quite straightforward for users to add their own visualization tools um, and, and to really create publication quality graphics uh, directly within uh, this online interface. Uh, finally, I just want to note that um, the, the Agmet Faceit instance, which is really our first prototype community, is actually launching in beta tomorrow morning um, at 8 a.m. Central Time um, to nearly 100 different users in Africa and South Asia. So um, I'm appropriately terrified of that and, and what's going to happen. And, uh, and David Kelly also uh, should be appropriately terrified of that as well because we're about to get hit by a a uh, crap storm of, of support uh, requests, I suspect. Uh, but it's going to be awesome. So uh, launching tomorrow, um, very fun, very exciting. Um, OK, uh, we also have we have tons of materials online for Faceit. Uh, there's a documentation page at learnfaceit.org. Um, and we have a YouTube channel where there's a lot of good uh, demo videos. So if you want to learn more, you can go and uh, watch um, you know, me or other people boringly drone on in, in, in 20 minute long demo videos. Actually, they're really, they really are interesting. I shouldn't, they're, they're not boring. Just skip to the middle. And, um, and that's it. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Josh. Can you still hear us? Yeah, I can. Okay. Uh, does anybody in the room have questions? Yeah. So when are we going to do this meeting in Nigeria? <laughs> Um, that's a good question. Uh, we need to find another meeting to piggyback off of. So that's the next key. I mean, 
Presumably, we can wait for the next uh, African uh, Sustainability Conference in August uh, 2015. I, I, I'm, I'm down for that. Or, or we can try a number of other meetings. Um, you know, AGMIP keeps trying to hold hold uh, their African meetings um, in, um, in 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 East Africa, and um, you know, hopefully. I think by now the you know the the paranoia of people for going to Africa and terrified that they're going to get Ebola for some reason has now finally subsided or at least for most of Africa. So hopefully we can actually get our European and American participants um, to to join us for for these meetings. So I, 2015 definitely for me we have to we have to make it happen. So you, you tell me you tell me when we want to do it. Do we want to wait until August or uh, do it even sooner? I'm I'm uh, I'm ready to go. I think the, the tools that you have developed and the fact that uh, there's still so much data to gather in previously understudied populations makes this really compelling that we should not be so uh, shy or so uh, risk averse in really getting students and building the network that we need to turn all these brilliant ideas into meaningful and useful uh, work uh, in, you know, for students all over sub-Saharan Africa who need to get exposed to this. That's absolutely right. I mean, for these regional studies, I mean, you need local, regional um, expertise, knowledge, and, and sort of data gathering capabilities that we absolutely don't have um, from, from Chicago or from the U.S. Um, and so that's why we're so, so eager to be able to trans transfer these platforms into you know software as a service type applications accessible um, through browsers and accessible to you know you know all the way from students up to you know advanced agricultural researchers throughout sub-saharan africa who can can start to apply them to you know regions as small as you know a few you know a, a couple hundred fields um in a small watershed in um, and, and really, really start to do the really detailed, detailed work that that is is the most interesting for these technologies.